Hey everyone, welcome to Stormcrest TV, the channel where two lit chicks talk about all things reading and writing. Today, that means we're talking about an amazing show called Sanditon. So, originally, Sanditon was an unfinished novel written by a very ill and mostly dying Jane Austen. She got up to, I believe, 12 chapters before taking a small break to die. So that was unfortunate. Now, I never actually read the book, and I can't start it because I have this thing where I don't like to start series that haven't been finished yet, so I'll just wait for Austin to get around to that. Yeah, sorry, I tricked you into yet another unfinished series. Yeah, thanks. Once you watch this show, though, I think that that's pretty much... I don't see how you can watch a show and not love it. Like, even my husband managed to love this ridiculous romantic show, and he normally hates girly movies and stuff at all times. I think it's because it appeals to all sorts of viewers. You, you've got action, you've got romance, you've got comic humor, you've got a whole lot of things going on in there. Which then leads me to the point of why we're making this video. Reasons to save Sanditon, and by that we mean reasons to renew it for a second season, or maybe even give us like a special or movie. So. Or just reasons to stream it because we love it and we just want to talk about it and we want more of it. And we are basically willing to do whatever it takes to make sure this happens. We'll get into the selling of our souls and contracts at the end of the video. Until then, let's let's go ahead and begin with Allegra. What what is your number one reason why Sanditon needs a proper send off? It needs a bloody ending. It just ends like they the the writers have come out and said in interviews they thought there was going to be a second season they left it open apparently it wasn't any any like a risk in anyone's opinion like they knew they had an amazing product they had a great cast they had a killer script yeah we're gonna get a second season and then ITV is like meh didn't get the numbers in the UK that we wanted but maybe if it gets good numbers in the US and Australia and it has and ITV is still like meh it's fine. I just don't understand, like, there is no justice in a universe where a show as well-written and well-produced and well-acted as Sanditon gets cancelled after season one, and you have sh like Riverdale that is going strong, and no one even knows what the hell is happening in that anymore. What is happening? What world am I li- Okay, no, I've got to stop. I'll calm down. Look, I like my trashy TV. God knows I was screaming about Love is Blind into the void for, like, weeks. I'm a little trash panda at heart. But That's all Jersey Shore. I'll say yeah, it. I mean, but, but Sanditon was actually really good and really refreshing. Like, it's a period piece drama romance that also does race and social issues and abuse and sex and the politics and of patriarchy and the, the downside and the dark side of that era you open up with this carriage that's just going way too fast on a precarious road and it's careening and suddenly tips over and the man who we later discover is tom parker gets out sprains his ankle and then the next thing you know they're going to sanditon with the girl whose lands they crashed on and no one really thought to question it like this was common we will sponsor your child for a month or three and no questions asked just send them along bring some clothes that's all you need and i, I mean you don't see that anymore you <laughs> unless you're related which <laughs> i mean to be fair now i think it's a crime to just take some <laughs> child and raise them for a little bit but it harkens to like this was common among that class obviously you don't really get that in the poorer classes unless you're talking about apprenticeships but like i'm gonna send you to go become a woman of the world or to go explore this place and you don't see that anymore her parents don't necessarily want charlotte to go but they understand she's old enough she's wanting to see more of the world she's not married she might as well go and kind of be their i guess ward for a few months and then you've got clara who's kind of likewise she's been handed off to lady denim like who's some sort of distant aunt or cousin so you've got one that's middle class wealthy staying with slightly wealthier friends of the family and then you've got clara who's staying who's very 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 poor staying with very 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 rich lady denim 
And you can see how this might allow for more uh, upward mobility. I I do so love Lady Denim. (laughs) She has life goals. Like, I want to be her when I'm old and just bitter. I just pictured that, like, old meme from back in the day of, like, Honey Badger, don't give a f***. Yeah. She's going to be crotchety just to make everyone's lives miserable because it gives her joy. There was never a moment I didn't like her. But I fell in love with her at the end when, you know, Esther is having her breakdown and her stepbrother runs in and is like, I love you, I love you. And they've got that whole commotion. And one of the ladies looks at her and says, don't judge her too harshly. And it's like, I don't judge her at all. It's like, I, I love that badass moment of her waking up and really just giving it to her family. Like, I'm disowning you and you're leaving. But that was the moment, I think, where... You see, she is a woman of compassion. She does understand how things work. She could have easily turned her back on Esther in that moment, but she doesn't. I did love her in that. Like, that kind of was her, oh, I get her now. Like, it doesn't come out of nowhere. You see that growth coming from the moment she wakes up again. Whereas, like, she tells the story to Esther of her youth and how she fell in love. And you can see her trying to guide Esther without telling her, you must do this, even though in her own way, she's like, yeah, you must do this. But the subtext is you need to do this because this is the only way for you to find happiness. And so you realize like, she's not meddling just to meddle. She's meddling because she truly does have the best intent for Esther and I'm sure before that she had the best intent for Clara and uh, he who shall not be named when you first get introduced to Esther in the show she's cool she's kind of a stock snotty background character and suddenly by the end of it she's actually one of my favorite heroines like she's probably one of my favorite characters on TV for a very long time aside from Margot Hansen of the magicians like she's oh wow this has been a really rough month for you hasn't it don't talk about it. I'm not prepared. <laughs> I'm, I binged this. Because you told me you need to go watch Sanditon. You need to be part of the Sanditon stand. And I was like, okay, I, I'll watch episode one. Next thing you know, it's midnight and I've finished watching them all. So this was a roller coaster for me in terms of Esther. <laughs> in episode one, I'm so certain I'm going to hate this character. But I was not expecting the sort of dynamic quality in Esther. So I hated her in episode one. You see the desperation, you see where it's coming from, but you can't really justify it. And honestly, it was really because she was being courted that you began to see the surface crack. And it was through those cracks that she blossomed. Sort of like, you know, Tupac's poem, The Rose That Grew From Concrete. She is that rose. It was really refreshing to see this human side of her in that moment of contrition and confession even though she stood nothing to gain she thought her aunt was gonna die and you know you like I spoke with Lady Dunham you have that moment where you realize you've fallen in love with the character for me it was that bedside confession I'm not sure when I fell in love with her I I know I was in love with her by then I think it was the push me pull you with her love interest and some of the like her going up against Clara like their rivalry you know clara gets to be the reflection a little bit of charlotte at first but then clara becomes the reflection of esther so poor clara and really in season two should get her own plot where she doesn't have to be reflecting someone else's stuff part of me deeply wants like there to be reconciliation between clara and esther because they came from a, a very similar background of pain what broke my heart with clara is she comes up to charlotte at the first ball and she's trying to explain this sexual issue and you see it in her face the actress does an amazing job the curtains just kind of come down across her her features because she realizes charlotte doesn't know what she's talking about that she lives in a different planet than charlotte like no one's hurt charlotte no one's abused charlotte charlotte's a a nice little pretty little puppy that lives behind a window and will never understand anything coming out of clara's mouth It, it does explain a few things to me because i remember when i began watching it i texted you There was so much sexual tension between the ensemble. Right. The reason I was prompted to send that text was because of the scene where they were getting ready to go out to the water and the girls were in the... uh, Bathing machine. The bathing machine. It was a beach house. They were in the changing room. It, It was a joke. But when I look back on that, having it been revealed to me, even then there was a sexuality about Clara 
that I think only really exists because of what she endured. The abuse mentality, I have to behave in such a way that I survive. That's why I am this little mouse in front of Lady Denim. And that's why I am this seductress and why I can endure so much pain. And so even in that first episode, I think they do a great job setting that up. There are Austin Pierce who are really upset about Sanditon and, you know, Charlotte's hair is down too much, even though I think what they were trying to get across there was like a shorthand for she doesn't have a maid. She isn't from the city. She isn't urban. She's not super rich. But that's a convenient costume shorthand to kind of make her seem less, a little younger and a little less worldly. But then they also got mad about the amount of sex and sexual issues in it. And I really liked that because a lot of, to me, like a lot of Austin, if you look and read between some of the lines, oh, what's going on. Yeah, there, there's a lot of subtext in Austin, but there's a lot of subtext in a lot of the novels that were written during her time. Well, now, if you want to go for, you know, yeah. similar era writing and, and books, like, uh, has anyone checked out Pamela or Clarissa or Evelina lately? Pamela is the worst. <laughs> I'm sorry. Pamela is eye bleeding. Uh, but there's definitely stuff happening in all of those, and they were very popular novels at the time, so you can't tell me that... George in England didn't do sex. It's also so realistic. As much as I'm sure people love to believe that every girl of a certain status was a virgin until marriage, that just wasn't the reality. Yeah, and speaking of virgins until marriage and everything else, like, uh, Miss Lamb, I felt so bad for her. I mean, first off, it's kind of awesome to finally have an Austin main-ish character, like, first-tier character, who is of color, (laughs) finally admitting that there are other people than white people but also she man does she go through it and i do like that her love interest spoiler alert turns out to be pretty much a willoughby and they did try to still give him like a depth of character anyway he is trying to do good things he isn't just a villain it's good to see the inclusion in this because all throughout austin you very much get the sense that she is anti-slavery. There, there's no ifs, ands, and buts about that. There's no subtext. She comes straight out in many of her books and says this is wrong. People shouldn't own people. You have certain things that go back into period pieces and they're like, oh, it's race blind. It doesn't matter. That's trivializing the issue. Especially like I, I am a person of color, a woman of color. And for someone to go, oh, well, it's race blind. It's like, well, no, please don't sweep that under the rug. I like that Sanditon tackles it head on. It's an uncomfortable sort of setting for her constantly because she's like, oh, I don't want to go somewhere where I am the attraction, where they gape at me and they're pineapples and they, they make me feel like this. So despite her having the money and the wealth and the status, they're not blind to her race. And that's a reality that I, I don't think many period pieces tackle with grace and i think this one has and i liked that they actually do include her boyfriend is actively working with ending slavery and i liked that you could see that this is how someone who was trying to do good thing can completely just drop all the balls i had a feeling about him i didn't like I understood it, but I didn't like the willingness to sort of just abandon Charlotte. Like, oh, great, thanks for bringing her. We're going to go have our picnic now. There, there were a lot of things that kind of clued me off that I don't I don't love him. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't think he was inherently a good person as a character. He's thoughtless. I, yeah, I, I didn't trust him with Miss Lamb. If Charlotte hadn't been as good a friend, and honestly... Caroline should be writing her thank you cards on that one because if Charlotte hadn't been there, somebody's going to be in the marriage real quick or possibly would have eloped that day. Which is interesting because if they just married Miss Lamb to the youngest brother, their financial issues would have been solved. Or frankly to Sydney, honestly, creepy as that is. But guys, George yeah, and that, England. That, that is jo- very George and England. I think Sydney would not have gone for that. No. More to the point... You're right. That could have really just drowned her in scandal. I know there are people like fandom who think that Otis and her should get back together, but when you even unintentionally sell me out to get sold off by some underworld kidnapper and forced into a 
property marriage and no no uh uh-uh, no like that's not a that's not a bridge we recross that bridge is burned i i get her heartbreak and i oh yeah i'm sad for her but i also get the sense that like this is just so high school i would like in season two for miss lamb to get another west indian or african love interest who is the stone cold awesome badass dude in charge who is going to love her and not gamble away most of the fortune on a bad weekend in vegas you know who i vote for Let's bring in Greg Chillin. And if you're not <laughs> sure who that is, in A Discovery of Witches, there's a character called Domenico. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's great for Miss Lamb. <laughs> you just want Domenico back on the screen. Don't you? <laughs> I mean, I do, but I had completely forgotten your Domenico fascination until this moment but yeah i i do think she needs a new love interest i don't even really care who it is as long as it's not otis and that's not to say i hate otis it's just to say you know sometimes (laughs) things don't work out i would like otis to have a good life just let's let's not do that I i would like stringer to have a good life too i really love that of the two men vying for charlotte's attention Neither one of them was evil. Like, Sydney was a dick. Oh, yeah. Um, but you know, in typical Austin fashion, he was a dick because of heartbreak. I, I like that Stringer wasn't your typical Willoughby or your George Wickham. He wasn't after anything. He fell for her mind. He fell for who she was, like, at a soul-deep level. But he also loves her enough to realize like he's not her first choice and so for the um people who are like well if we have a season two and she ends up with stringer and that's fine i would say i'm not fine with that because i do like stringer and i do like charlotte but i think stringer needs someone who would put him first someone who would choose him first and see i'm on the complete opposite side of this argument so by the end of it like charlotte's heartbroken stringer is everything like stringer's entire life just goes up in flames literally and figuratively and they're both like completely destroyed honestly if you do season two with a time skip and their paths cross again it's really starting something new because it's less of a continuation over this season and everything else like they could meet up again and it could be something completely new with you know different goals for both of them And I think that would be amazing. Here's my rebuttal. The chemistry I feel between them is very much on a friendship scale. And he's hella friend-zoned. There's like seven different points where I can pinpoint where she just pushed him right back into that circle of friend. And it's like you can even see it on on his face. Like, oh, wow. You, You really just... Well, he was also too shy to bring it up properly. So, And Charlotte's not the most clued in of people. No, but Theo James does such an amazing job with Sydney that the love that that character feels for Charlotte, you can feel it through whatever screen you're watching. He doesn't even have to say it. You see it in his very presence. It's in his being. It's in his eyes. This is a man who is expressing things about this character that were never spoken on screen. Oh, yeah, no. His performance of Sydney is amazing. But, again, is season two? I, yeah, I would like her and Sydney to get back together, but if they don't kill off his soon-to-be wife in a tragic carriage accident, uh, there's a problem. Or maybe, and you see it in that last scene where he's like, oh my god, what am I doing? As the carriage is, like, leaving, you can see that regret in his eyes. I don't know, maybe it might be good for Tom to just eat his own shit and figure out how to get through it. Like, I know it it really just ravishes the rest of the family. But, I mean, as the... I don't... I don't... And see, I don't think I could respect Sydney anymore if he did, because George and debtor's prisons are not pretty things, and the entire family goes in. So it's not just Tom, it's the kids. And if, you know, if you choose... And I love that they did that with the plot line, too, because this is horrible. 
I mean, this is the epitome of that earlier time mindset of individuality versus the family. And this is definitely one of those ones of he has to put the family first because it's the kids, it's Mary and Tom who kind of deserves it. And it's possibly Arthur or Diana can go into debt trying to get Tom out. And he's doing the one thing that could save everything. Plus all of the workers, I mean, Stringer included, like everyone is depending on the Sanditon development. So you and have yet to all of it. it can be solved by these few words. Miss Lamb, can I have a loan? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe someone should have asked that. Like, I... I feel like that's why they didn't show more discussion or her leave taking between Miss Lamb and, and Charlotte because yeah, I feel like you would have wound up with a whole nother episode and possibly Miss Lamb interrupting with a few words. Um, but no, we wanted the the ending for this the end cap for this season to go on to next season. Yeah, and I, I see that as being probably the most likely solution if they do have a season two. I think it would be Caroline and possibly some intervention by Lady Susan. A few other things. Oh, I but... love Lady Susan. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the fairy godmother of society, yes. Yes, and I love how much she hates Sydney's new fiancé. Oh, she's so evil. She is like... Blair, Waldorf, and Mean Girls in, like, a blender, and it's it's bad. Even she really just adds to how well this ensemble worked together. And I don't know. I mean, maybe they hated each other behind the scenes, and maybe they're just all just amazing actors. But they meshed so well. Nothing really felt out of place. But even, like, the bit players, like the drunk friend, Crow, I loved him. Like, they, they did such a great job. I, I want a Crow storyline. I honestly, like, there is, I was making jokes while I was watching it that I would have totally watched, like, Babington, Crow, and and Sydney just go drunken boys' nights. Because, like, the boys together were hysterical. Yes. Just, like, the few times you saw them. And, like, when they go in and wake Sydney up in a pub and he's been drinking all night. <laughs> I'm like, yes, let's just have the three of you wander George and England, get drunk, and be stupid. Go. And my favorite was right before the cricket match. Tom, yeah, like, are you drunk? And he's like, no more than usual. Crow is always drunk. It's amazing. Crow is a mood, and I, I am that <laughs> mood. Apparently, in one of the novel versions, there's, like, a hint of a thing with him and Clara, and I totally would be down for that, because... I think Clara scheming and Crow just being obliviously drunk would be kind of hysterical. I just think there would be some sort of poetry to it because at the beginning when they're like, you know, we've come for game and it's like, oh, there's nothing to shoot here in this neighborhood. And they all sort of grab their own girl and they were all lined up three and three. It's like the, the parallelism of them ending up with those three in the end would just be delicious. I would totally be down for it. But oh my like, god, Babington really, like, you looked at him in that first scene that you saw him, and you're like, well, you're gonna be a douchebag. And then by the end, you're like, you are the best man on screen. Like, <laughs> how, how do you exist? You're the best. She Honestly, by the end, uh, Sydney is shiny and all, but, like, Babington is the one that I'm truly in love with. Like, love Sydney. He's gorgeous and pretty to look at, but Babington is uh, yes, please, more. Babington is what she needed, and I don't even think Esther realized the depth of her abuse until Babington really pointed it out. And, you know, she's sitting there going, oh, he's a fool, he's an idiot, but he is actually extremely astute and observant. He is not a fool. And I think it does speak well of Crow and Sydney that they have a friend like this, because I think it speaks to their character. Yeah, because, like, by the end, Crow becomes, like, the, the element of mystery there because they all kind of come off, like, assholes at the start. Like, oh, oh my god, are they such dicks. Like, the boys' club mentality, the, they're so childish and dumb. And then Babington becomes, like, this an amazing romantic hero, and so does Sydney, like, sleeper hit a bit. Then you're, like, looking at both of them and going, okay, there's gotta be, I bet there's, like, some reason Crow is drunk all the time, and I bet, like, there's more to it than this. And I would really love to explore their friendship. <laughs> I, I would love to know more about Crow. Because, you know, you don't just randomly become friends with people. There's something that draws you to people. And, you know, 
people have been saying from the very first episode, Sydney comes across as abrasive, he's arrogant, but deep down he's got a good heart. And that also proved true for Babington. It's There's got to be some of that in Crow. And I think there is, because some of his teasing with Sydney, some of his lines with other people, he does hint that <laughs> underneath the raging amount of alcohol that boy is, in, is taking in is like probably someone who's not an idiot i think (laughs) an excellent plot point for next season would be caroline having a showdown with sydney about what the heck have you done to my best friend like she's left she's gone you've broken her heart all over all for money again how dare you even though sydney's right and caroline is also right like i think the showdown for of them for having another season of you know, well, adoptive no. parent <laughs> kerfuffles would be hysterical. I do think Sydney needs to do some groveling. <laughs> don't get again. I don't think they just need to run back into each other's arms and go. Oh, I'm really sorry. That sucked. Obviously, you need tension, and you need you. In this instance, Sydney needs to be the one to bridge that gap and make the apologies. And yeah, there does need to be that showdown because the interesting point as you said, they were both right. Sydney was not wrong to engage himself to Eliza because in that moment, that was the only path he could see to save his family. I did love their parting scene when he wrote up, even though it broke my heart because he didn't keep her there. <laughs> you know, despite all logic and, and characterization, like part of me still just wanted him to be like, nope, never mind, we're getting married. But uh, yeah, as long as I don't do another apology like the the Otis Caroline goodbye scene which is when I lost like a thousand points of respect for Otis because instead of just getting on his hands and knees and groveling to her because she is amazing and sweet and was still trying to give him some kind of benefit of the doubt and he just blamed it on other people and it was like no matter what they tell you I I was great I was amazing I didn't do any of this and I was like and there there you go Caroline there's your warning yep the red flag as it were if you do keep in line with Sydney's character I do see him accepting personal responsibility at least as far as he owns it I don't see him going man I should have insured those buildings because that wasn't his mistake but I the person who doesn't know how to own their mistakes of the Parker brothers is Tom Sydney, I think, is actually fairly good at being self-deprecating. Oh, yeah. Sydney's, I mean, that's almost a weakness to a point. Like, he gets way too into it. But I don't, I don't know. I I would love to see season two. I hope we get a season two. Please give us a season two. Yeah. The PBS affiliates have been tweeting and talking to fans, and there has been interaction. Like, I don't necessarily need, like, eight more episodes if you want to do like a Downton Abbey sort of thing where you wrap it up with a movie or you give us like a two hour special, I'm fine with that. I will write the skirt. I will do what I have. Just call me. Call me. Find me on Twitter. We volunteer as tribute for the screenwriting. If you agree that season two of Sanditon needs to be greenlit, Leave a comment down below if you have anything to add or if you have any questions, um, feel free to do the same. You can communicate with us on Twitter, Instagram as well, though admittedly Allegra is much better at Instagram than I am. Like and subscribe, hit the bell for notifications for new videos, and we have a Facebook, Two Lit Chicks, make sure you check that out. But yeah, if you haven't watched Sanditon, go do that right now. But yeah, have a great day and happy viewing.